So uh, first of all, I'll try to compliment the things that have already been said. Um, it's a real pleasure to be here. Uh, for um, As it has been said, Alive and Thrive actually, from my point of view, it's very clear when a project begins. It's when it gets approved by Bill and Melinda. <laughs> and that day happened to have been sometime, I should have gotten the exact date, in late October 2008. Why do I remember that? Because about a week later, the stock market crashed. And I often wonder if we would have been born at all had we waited to take things to approval, because that actually did create a fair amount of you know, upheaval and, and, and reflection about what we were doing. 2008 is a long time ago for all of us, uh, but it's an especially long time ago in the life of the Gates Foundation, which was quite young at that time and is um, uh, uh, you know, things change very rapidly. Um, people say, how did you last at the Gates Foundation so long? I've been there for more than 10 years now. And I always say very <laughs> succinctly, uh, alive and thrive, still learning, still having fun. <laughs> We're all still talking to each other too, which is great. <laughs> We've been through a lot together. Um, back at the time that alive and thrive, and, oh, I'm going to try to touch on four things um, since Karen had hers. First is a little bit of context, then I'm going to talk about how globally applicable and how I think the findings of Alive and Thrive have influenced the research globally. Uh, I'm going to try that at least. Um, how, what some lessons about the approach and, the struct and structure of the grant. Uh, Karen's touched on some of those things, um, maybe how we might do things differently in the future, and then spin off influences that this investment has had on the Gates Foundation. Hopefully I'll get through that before I get my red card. Um, anyway. So um, Alive and Thrive, well, the Gates Foundation was a very different place back in 2008. And there, back then, um, there were a bunch of things we did not do, and there were some things that we did do. And the things that we supposedly did were we were supposed to place big bets, take risks, and give our partners freedom to fail. So I don't know if you all remember that, but <laughs> that was a big uh, kind of context and that we were working in. We could actually, we set up Alive and Thrive as a learning grant, and remember that. And that's why we had the luxury of being able to do all of that research, because part and parcel of the investment was this idea that we, the biggest benefit, there would be impacts on the populations that were reached, but the greatest benefit of it would be the learning and the ability to translate that learning more widely. And so that was a pretty big sell <laughs> at the time of approval. There was a lot of back and forth around what that meant, and I won't go into details because we are being taped. <laughs> but it was an interesting, I know um, Marie and uh, Purnima remember that conversation. Some of the things we did not do at the time of the Gates Foundation, uh, at, the, at the Gates Foundation at the time we were um, approved is we did not do behavior change. So wow, we approved a gigantic program that was really about social and behavior change. We called it demand generation. Uh, flash forward, we now have a whole group that deals with social and behavior change at the Gates Foundation. Um, we didn't do delivery. <laughs> this was about impact at scale and models for impact. I think we skirted around that by, by actually making the case for, you know, lives saved and dallies averted. So we used evidence to prove that this was a worthwhile investment. We didn't do breastfeeding. We were about, as you said, innovations in science and technology. And at that point, you know, breastfeeding wasn't seen as a, a technology. It, we've changed that. Uh, well, we haven't necessarily changed that as a perception, but we have widely embraced as a foundation the importance of breastfeeding and the need to support it at many different levels, uh, social, uh, facility, community, um, and so on. But that's been widely embraced, largely because of the, of the evidence, the stories, the learnings, and the, and the experience of Alive and Thrive. So those were some of the things that we didn't do. Now, flashback back then, the context that we were working in, and this is my reflection on the context that we were working in back in 2007 when we wrote the RFP, which was uh, led to the grant being awarded in 2008. My perspective was that um, breastfeeding was pretty widely acknowledged as a critical child survival intervention. It was seen as a mechanism for saving lives. We kind of knew what to do about it. There was a ton of great experience that Alive and Thrive built on, largely USAID funded linkages and pre predecessor projects. It really gave us a lot of lessons learned and experience on how to do breastfeeding. We had the 10 steps to successful breastfeeding. Um, but, and I think there was a perception we knew what to do, but we lacked examples, documented examples of doing it at scale and impact of that, doing that at scale. 
And I think, frankly, that we saw breastfeeding really as some kind of ho-hum in yesterday's news, <laughs> that it was a mother's choice and that it was really not so terribly exciting. So I thought, wow, we really need to put in some innovation and something exciting and new and different. So the mandate really was to demonstrate at scale, but to really be innovative and alive and thrive. The situation with complementary feeding, I think, was a lot different. We had fewer success stories. The concern, there was a huge concern that it was too complex. It was context dependent. It was intractable to change. I have two minutes. Oh my God! Uh, due to economic uh, constraints and cultural practices, and there was also this uh, perception that you actually needed specialized food products uh, in order to have an impact on, on complementary feeding, which was actually built into the original grant. And we le certainly learned how challenging that would be uh, to implement at scale. And so some of the barriers that we create uh, in the countries we were working where a lot of our local partners really didn't feel that we needed to bring in specialized food products in order to solve a problem and that we could do much more on social and behavior change. So um, in the case of complementary feeding, we needed both a case of, uh, we needed real innovation and out of the box thinking and demonstration that it actually, we could do something at scale. So the idea of impact at scale was always baked into the project from the very start, we weren't going to be trying to do boutique things that were very specialized, couldn't be scaled. And we had this concept of sustainability baked in from the start because we felt that um, it, everything needed to be transitioned to have this longer term impact. That's one of the areas I think we'll, we, I'll get back to if I have time. Um, so some of the uh, words that if I had to do one of those word searches around Alive and Thrive, I would come up with learning. Um, <laughs> Uh, demonstrate, innovate, evaluate, learn, and then replicate. And the replication concept was really um, this idea that these original three countries would serve as models, so they would have common elements in terms of their epidemiology, their delivery platforms, the way you would actually reach scale, the types of behaviors you were trying to change, and then the ability, different levels of um, supportive uh, um, structure either at the community or through mass media and I think Bernima you kind of touched on that so I won't talk about those different models but the, each project of those original three kind of had a tagline as to what it was trying to accomplish and what it represented as a model and actually interestingly enough when I took this grant to be approved besides some of the niggling around M&E and around um, you know, you, uh, what the things we didn't do. <laughs> um, this idea, our CEO at the time, who was Patty Stonecipher, said, you know what, this is the real impact and benefit of this grant will be in that component, the idea that you could actually have impact beyond the boundaries if you really set things up to, to achieve that goal. And I, I really, that really resonated with me because that was the intent. However, now I'm going to get to some of the lessons learned. I know I'm going to get like my red card any second. Um, so just in terms of the question of whether or not um, the impact, the global impact of Live and Thrive, I would say, um, in terms of the research and the publications, without a doubt, it's been global, has had a global impact. It's had an impact in a lot of different ways. Um, the publications are one very important part of it. That learning will sustain the capacity development opportunities that it has afforded throughout the world. Uh, to many individuals, students, researchers, and ourselves was, I think, really incomparable. I'm extraordinarily proud to have been part of that and, you know, to have uh, to be, say, that, that that was offered. We've learned an enormous amount, as uh, you've heard already, about determinants of behavior change, the role of different delivery platforms, and so much more. So I think that there's no question um, that there has been a global impact. Uh, the impact was felt before the primary data were published, which I think is a big lesson that you can't wait for that paper to come out, that you really have to draw on the lessons, which is why those intermediary process evaluations, formative studies, and so, so on were so critically important. The focus on implementation learning with rigorous methods, I think, is unprecedented in the field, and it's one of these areas which I hope the foundation will take up more, but I, I, I can't say with, uh, with definitive, uh, um, you know, definitive, uh, um, definitively, that that's a, an approach that's been replicated elsewhere. I would love to see it. Similarly, the way we structured the grant to have a, a quasi-independent evaluation partner that was there from the beginning, but not there just to rubber stamp and cheerlead about the results, but really to be rigorous in terms of evaluation and learning, I thought was a brilliant model. I'm glad we all learned to live with it. It was, wasn't always easy, but it really did add value in my mind. And it isn't, and it, you know, to being able to be rigorous, to be able to document and to challenge each other about the 
the assumptions we make in terms of how we're delivering things, the learning about how you deliver things at scale was as important as the fact that we may have changed this or that behavior by that much. And if we hadn't done it that way, I'm not sure we would be able to say that. And that's another thing that I'm not sure I can say we've replicated elsewhere, but it's something, a model, I think, would be um, very important to, to take up. Uh, in the future, um, we have actually, as you saw from one of the earlier slides, seen that the benefits of this work have been sufficiently strong that there has been demand for, not from us, but from countries and others, to actually expand that work. Uh, so we have, as you saw, um, Alive and Thrive activities, not just in those three initial countries, but in Burkina Faso, India, Nigeria, the ASEAN and ECOWAS regions. Other donors have supported it. Um, Irish Aid in, Can in Canada, but also USAID and DFID have picked up pieces, and the World Bank has picked up pieces. It's been this idea of creating tools and materials and approaches that can be taken up and replicated has actually had some impact. Um, I now want to talk about some of the things that I think were naive assumptions on our part that I hope I have learned from and uh, ways that I think we were overly optimistic. The first thing was that these three countries could provide all the context or the prototype models that were needed. Whew, clearly not the case. <laughs> We have definitely successes that we've just talked about in terms of adaptation, um, but you know, one country in Africa does not tell you the entire story for Africa. That is without a doubt. Um, we uh, there, uh, there are so many different nuances in terms of delivery platforms, in terms of how you do things um, that are so varied. And so I thought that that was one area. Well, wow, boy, was that an, a great idea? Perhaps to. Uh, naive in its conceptualization. Another one was this concept of sustainability. We said sustainability should be baked in from the outset and how we, the uh, local programs would be taken up by partners um, after what we call this proof of concept of impact of, of deliverability at scale ended. I think we did a great job of doing it, but then things happen. Context change, funding changes, government priorities change, any number of things change in that context that really upset um, you know, our plans to actually fully embed some of these interventions. Um, with that said, one thing we're able to do as a learning grant is study those things. And that's something we're doing that I think is really unique, which is really going back and looking at what happened, what processes, what was uptaken, and what changes were made. Because it wasn't as though we know things went away completely, largely because the institutions we're working, we worked with on the ground are still there and doing work. But we need to understand better how to make this transition from this learning uh, investment into just fully sustainable, um, sustainable impact. So that's something I think I have my eye on for in, in the future. Um, the, um, I'm going to try to, sh to skip up. Um, <laughs> this issue about, like, we had this idea, you know, of estimating, like, I sold it to some people, leadership, <laughs> on how many lives we would save and the dallies averted. We had models and things like that that would project these things. We had predicated at the outset we'd have to reach so many people. We did all these assumptions. We made these guesses. Boy, <laughs> was that naive. Um, we know for a lot of other reasons that, um, you know, I, I guess we knew all along that, you know, stunting is a multifactorial process. Any of us who've worked in nutrition for a long time know how complicated it is. We're, in fact, quite remarkably shocked, all of us, I would say, how much traction this idea of stunting has had recently in terms of, you know, being a priority because we've all felt how complicated it is. Um, but um, we felt like we actually expected that these interventions would have impact on stunting. And what we, I think, failed to realize or acknowledge is that stunting is actually going down in a lot of places. And we're layering these things on in the context. All three of those countries' stunting rates happily went down. And there's a lot of other things happening at the same time in these countries. So the ability to, in place of robust and rigorous Lancet publication ready evaluation design into the real world settings that we live in, I think, really is something that requires a major kind of open conversation of how would we really do it differently, um, what really makes sense. To try to say that this intervention alone um, was responsible in the world that we live in today, I think, is extraordinarily optimistic. And I would say to myself, I was naive. <laughs> and so I think in terms of um, other areas where I feel that the work itself has influenced the Gates Foundation and how we do our business, as I said before, breastfeeding, for one, and complementary feeding, <laughs> to some degree, are widely embraced. Uh, 
Uh, there's no question whatsoever that the value of breastfeeding in all its aspects is seen. It's because of Alive and Thrive and other evidence that we've been able to pull in to help convince other audiences as well. But having that ability to say, we could actually do this and reach scale uh, for these things has been enormously important. Um, either because of Alive and Thrive or perhaps you're happy, happily along for the ride, this idea of social and behavior change needing to be a science with rigor and a valuable input into our foundation's ability to achieve its goals is now also firmly established. I'm very happy to say we no longer have to skirt around that issue. And then when people say, ah, oh, when they've, it's been newly discovered, then they say, oh, but Alive and Thrive has been doing that. <laughs> and so then we can bring out all our lessons, all our documentation, the very, you know, rigorous way that we have been able to design and learn from it and it does give people ideas and gain, gain credibility. Um, what's that? Okay, I will say one last thing. Um, okay, I will just say that. I will stop there. That was my last thing. Sorry. <laughs> no. All right. I think that's a good, good these, these are fantastic insights. It was...